um, right uh, after experiencing so much violence uh, around you? I mean, how does one do that? And I know that um, Ali Masrui, for example, has, uh, has written the novel The Trial of Christopher Okikbo because Okikbo participated or, um, you know, took the decision to participate in the war in Nigeria and uh, Robert Serumaga again participating in the war in Uganda. And, um, so as a writer, how does one do this? How do you delay? Is it possible to delay? Or is it possible to use both the pen and the bullet? Or is it one or the other? Or is it possible to have both? And I don't think that uh, that's a question that you, you, you will want to, to venture into. I think you had a, you had a, I had a, 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 a question related to socialist realism and whether it destroys your creativity. Then we'll come to the audience after this. Yeah, well, as I said, you know, I mean, socialist realism uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, that to be done at the time. You know, look, he was a small front, uh, leading a bunch of, uh, very few people, uh, relatively speaking, when, when, it, when you speak, you know, there was, it was almost like we were, Outnumbered ten to one by Ethiopian soldiers for most of the uh, war warriors, uh, and therefore, you know, putting literature and the arts in the service of the revolution worked for the for the front. It worked for the front a lot. It pulled people together. People were dancing and singing even today. People are dancing. You know, all the all the nationalities can 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 sing and dance. The uh, the uh, the songs and dances of each other. Uh, so it was a necessary thing that had to be done. Uh, you know, it was, it was something that was necessitated by the circumstances that we uh, that we did. And I was, as a matter of fact, one of the proponents of socialist theorism, by the way. Um, but there was always the insistence that, given that, because because you know the the submergence of the individual to the collective always takes away a lot from literature. Because it's the individual uh, perception of, of revolution, the individual acts of heroism, the individual acts of cowardice, uh, if, if you want, that uh, that change the situation, that either uh, push uh, uh, a revolution forward or sometimes uh, you know pull it back, uh, and therefore going deep into uh, the individual experiences of uh, of, uh, of fighters. Uh, was not something that was traditionally done, you know. But now, but now I think we are looking back, and uh, as I said, a couple of books that have come out uh, make the anti-hero the, the main subject of uh, of the paper. My 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 own book, uh, the Hadara, deals with the experiences of of a former shifta, a bandit, who becomes a fighter, and a lot of people were not very happy with it because they thought, you know, I mean, why shifta? Why not? An exemplary, uh, an exemplary fact. So there was that kind of, of a feeling, but it didn't really kill the kind of a, a, a literature that we had previously, because there was really not much to refer to. You see, so whatever it was that was produced there was innovative, and it was uh, important at the time because um, obviously you wanted, you know, it was important to consolidate the revolution and to bring people together and ensure that there is a, a unity of purpose and so on. You referred to the colonial period and said that newspapers were important incubators for Eritrean literature. One year after the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia ended in 2001, the government banned all private newspapers. What has been the effect of that? And is that something that you think was a wise decision on the part of the government? given its previous support of uh, the development of culture. I am from the Embassy of Eritrea. I am the first Secretary there. Adam Sabad was uh, a freedom fighter, and I was a freedom fighter too. I know Adam Sabad years back, in fact, a decade back. He was one of our best writers during the armed struggle, with all the hardship, with all the blanket bombardment, that you should write very interesting and colorful novels. One of the novels, which I never forget, is The Heart of a Fighter, that he wrote in 1988. 
I was in the battle of Abad, and I used it to read that novel for almost 10 times. I want to ask Alan Zagar one question. The fighter, Alan um, Zagar shares uh, common values with me. Not much has been written about um, the Eritrean Arms struggle. We know that. We are a bit backward in literature. What is the main reason that such history is not written? To some extent, I know Eritreans do not want to talk much about themselves. Is this the main stumbling block that so many things have not been written up to now? This is my question. Thank you. Your country is a coastal country in, in a very strategic spot, the whole of Africa. And again, um, your country has been exposed to historical influences as a result of contact with colonizers and otherwise. So I would like to know exactly what is the contribution of the Eritrea diaspora in shaping the direction and drive of contemporary writing. Again, the contribution. Yeah, what is the diaspora? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. When you were reading from your book, one moment you, you read a line saying, I remember feeling inadequate about writing. And in the next moment, in complete contradiction, you said, with utter simplicity, it was a human heart complete with iota and arteries. And the heart of an Eritrean soldier, triumphant and victorious. And it seemed to me a complete, oh well, the simplicity and the honesty with which you, you read those lines reminded me of what you were speaking about, the Dajas, and the power of, of, of the, the emotion. Could you explain those, oh, that literature, Eritrean literature as a philosophy, so that I can understand and could you, could you point, maybe it's my wrong assertion, but do you see any relationship between the poetry you recited from, from the Dajas and what you read in your own book? Thank you. I think, I think I, well, if I understand the question, um, uh, in his reading, there's this section he talks about, he felt extremely inadequate as a writer. Okay? Uh, because he's out there in the trenches. And then as he continues, he really does give a very graphic description uh, of the altar and you know, this human um, you know, destruction as it were. So on the one moment, uh, you are totally incapable of continuing to write. Yes. Uh, but as you move along, you have these very detailed um, description of really the destruction. So he's trying to wonder how do you um, how do you reconcile that? Okay, let me start with, with, with you. With you. Um, what I'm saying there is there was you know, when we went to the Battle of Africa, there were some five, four or five of us journalists and uh, the commanding general there was not called the general then but the commanding the guy that I like myself a freedom fighter, he told us we're going to attack this garrison here. We're going to finish it in 12 hours, in, in uh, 12 hours, 20, 24 hours, if not 48 hours. Then we're withdrawing. Simple as that. And he gave us a piece of paper, and it looked like a, a, a mathematical table. Two plus two is equal to four, kind of. We do this, we do this, we do this, we do that. If this doesn't happen, then we go back. And we were surprised. We said, come on. Now, now. This is a huge garrison. I mean, this is a huge uh, front. And how are you going to destroy it like this? And I said, well, you try it. You're with us. So just keep quiet now. We have three, four days. It's a secret. Don't talk to anybody. You stay around, you know. Eat, drink. So we waited, and then the battle started. It was not finished in 24 hours. Then it was finished in 48 hours. I couldn't believe that this could have happened. And then there it was. There was these waves and waves of prisoners of war and so on and so forth, destruction, death, planes screeching and everything. And I was jotting down these notes and I said, two, two times captured. One plane 
destroyed fell. I saw 58 uh, prisoners of war in one place, things like that. You know, it became so mundane. So I couldn't continue. I don't think I would have written that for that magazine. I would have refused to say this is, you know, I'm not going to give a report, a reportage. So I was thinking about this when this specimen came right in front of me. And I thought this was a miracle. We talked with the commander that I'm talking about, Ali Ibrahim. I told him several times, I said, several times I repeated to him, I said, how can we, on the day of the victory of Afghanistan, find a human heart like there and the, the heart of a fighter? And he said, it's because you are a writer. You writers are crazy for me. He told me, you're crazy, you're crazy writers. Why don't you just write about the heart if you want to? Because I've seen so many things worse than that. He told me that he had seen him. He was once involved in a, in a situation, in a place where uh, his group was sitting down and then a plane came and landed a huge bomb right in the middle of where they were. And, you know, it created a crater, you know, that many people went into the crater and came out, you know, all dust and smoke and everything. And everybody was there intact except one person. It was like, and when they examined him, they found out that they had, he had some blood, some little things here. This is gory, I'm sorry, but that's, that's what he told me. And then, when they, and then they found out that actually, because of the pressure, of the noise, the pressure, his skull had opened at the, at the, at the, at the here, and most of his brain had left, had just, because of the pressure, because of the vacuum created. It's cut up. So he said, I've seen so many things in the world that live on Marte. So I decided, you know, this is a way out for me. I bought this, this piece. And I, as he said, it became a very famous, very famous, very popular uh, piece of uh, the description of, 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 of what it meant to be a fighter or a terrible life. So that's what I meant, you know. I was inept and inadequate to describe this kind of a victory and then this specific concept. It, it saves me from, from, from writing a, a reportage that would have been forgotten a long time ago. It's related to what? Is it related to the traditional literature and traditional poetry? Um, probably, yeah. When, it, when you read it in Tigrinya, you find some images there that would be, uh, uh, that would probably refer back to the old traditions, yes. Um, the, the, the diaspora question, well, you know, I mean, that's what I was going to ask you, I mean, it ties in with uh, your question, uh, and, you know, the fact that uh, there are no, uh, there is no private press in Eritrea, and what effect does it have on, uh, on, on, on literature? Um, you know, the fact that there is no private press on the space in which Writers operate in Eritrea is limited. It does not, as far as I'm concerned, make a difference because, because in the diaspora, we don't have any Warsan, the Warsan Shiras and so on. I don't know why Eritreans in the diaspora don't write. Uh, but most of the uh, literature that is coming out of the diaspora are research papers, you know, big volumes of <coughs> Eritrean history, you know, different aspects of uh, Eritrean life. Uh, but more or less research and not creative writing. I think there are some, I've read a couple of uh, creative writings uh, that might pass for, for uh, you know, good, okay, good, good writing, or some parts of it are good. But uh, no, nothing of the volume and, uh, and, and, uh, and quality and, uh, and quali quantity that exists in other places has, has really come out from, from the diaspora. So the absence of, uh, uh, of a free press uh, in Eritrea, I don't think, uh, has in any way or has affected much the way literature had been even before that. No, I, 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 I don't know. I, I learned there, are, there are friends of mine here, you know, uh, former colleagues who, uh, who, who live here. I, I haven't seen any significant contributions in the diaspora, as far as uh, in return, uh, language and literature is concerned. Um, yeah, then there was the question on, um, on who is writing the narrative. I mean, the, the, the direction 
revolution was so powerful. I mean, it's in a country of war. Uh, and yet, you know, that story has not been written. We've read South Africa, we have read Mozambique, Angola, Tanzania, uh, with the Jama and so on. But nothing much from yeah. the well, um, Yeah, I mean, uh, there are, and if it's, we're not facing it. We're not very, uh, we're, not, we're not used to these kinds of things. You know, I'm, I'm probably one of the first people who's speaking openly about, uh, I mean, in, in this kind of a setting.